I want to um, I want to say just a word before we dive into Romans chapter 6 this morning about what all of us have uh, seen this weekend going on up in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, I, I just want to, to be clear that what we have seen is a manifestation of demonic activity. The Bible is very clear that men and women, all human beings, are created in the image of God and worthy of dignity and respect as a result of that. And anyone who does not align with what the Bible teaches there has the spirit of Antichrist. It, it's pure and simple. I want to read to you something that I read this morning that was helpful to me because most of what I have seen expressed online on social media, Twitter and Facebook has been appropriate condemnation and outrage over what we've seen. But this was helpful in terms of, of helping me counsel my own thinking about responding with, with more than just outrage. David Nasser, who is the director of student life for the students at Liberty University and is of Middle Eastern descent. Uh, he is uh, married to a woman from Alabama. They have a mixed race daughter and an adopted son. He said, my family is committed to condemn racism by the way we let our outrage turn into outreach every day. Isn't that good? This to us is more than an emotional reaction but a lifelong conviction. He says, as a Christian family, we contribute our time, our treasure, and talent to see hate erased. Christ compels us to do that. As our great model, he showed us how to love with impartiality, how to treat all people as equal. We believe the horrific acts of white supremacy we have seen in, on display in Charlottesville have one ultimate cure, and that is Christ's supremacy. And as I read that, I thought, I need to be aware that in my own sphere this week, I need to redouble my own efforts to treat everybody I come into contact with, with dignity and worth and value and love and grace. And, and just to check my own spirit, whether it's in the line at the supermarket or whether it's seeing somebody on the street or somebody in the office, whatever it is, just to say, how can I be an extension of Christ's love to that person and demonstrate grace? So. That's going to be my challenge and uh, my charge for this week, and it's my charge for you as well as we uh, ask the question, how can we respond to what we've seen going on in our world? Now, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, I want to uh, go to Romans chapter 6. That's where we're going to be spending time in the second half of Romans chapter 6. Uh, if you've read ahead, you know that in the second half of Romans 6, Paul has circled back and he is, he, he came in for a landing last week at the end of verse 14, and then he looped back up and said, let's take this one more time. It's a little bit like Henry VIII, okay? Second verse, same as the first. It's, it, he's just going to readdress what he's been looking for as he's talking about the relationship between sin and grace. That's the subject. What is the relationship between sin and grace? And as we saw last week, beginning in chapter one or verse 1 of chapter 6, he asked the question, should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? In other words, if, if God pours out grace when we sin, should we then sin more so that God will give us more grace and, and trigger his grace through our sin? And he says very strongly, no way, may it never be, that's out of the question, don't even think like that. That's his answer to that question. And then he says the reason is because you're dead to sin. You are no longer under the jurisdiction of sin. You no longer live in, in that area. So when sin tries to collect its taxes, you just say, I don't owe you anything. You are dead to sin. And then he explains what dead to sin looks like. And the reason you're dead to sin is because you're united to Christ. That's your death to sin is connected to the fact that you're united with Christ. Jesus is dead to sin. You're united with him, so you're dead to sin too. That's his argument in the first half of chapter 6. And then you get to verse 15, and he asked a similar question, not exactly the same. He says, are we to sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? And he gives the same answer, by no means. And then he switches from talking about being dead to sin and now he's talking about being slaves to sin 
as a new metaphor. And that's where our focus is going to be this morning. We're going to divide this message up into three parts. Part one, I'm going to read to you a story I wrote. I wrote a short story about Romans 6, the second half of the chapter. Then part two, I'm going to address some of the textual issues that you find in the passage. And then in part three, I want to talk about the application and, and what we're slaves to. Okay, so that's going to, and, and, and when we talk about slavery, we're not talking about uh, slavery in the South from 150 years ago. We're not talking about human trafficking that's present in our world and our community today. We're talking about the kind of slavery that keeps us in bondage, everyone in this room in bondage, to patterns and habits that are ungodly. That's what we're talking about. So I'm going to read my story, but before I read the story, Join me, let's pray together for our time of worship. God, we need you in this moment. You've told us that without your aid, we can't understand the things we're about to read. We may be able to understand the words, but we can't understand what's at the heart of this text unless you give us the gift of illumination. And so that's what we're asking you for now. We ask that you would open our hearts and open our eyes and our ears that we might hear what your spirit is saying to each one of us through your word this morning. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read through the passage before I read you my story, okay? Uh, this is Romans 6, beginning at verse 15. This is the word of God for the people of God. Follow along as I read. What then? Are we to sin because, because we're no longer under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and have been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just, as you were one, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. When I was in high school and then again in college, there were times when my English professor would assign me a, a term paper to do. And most of the time I wrote a normal term paper, but there were some times that I just didn't want to write a normal term paper. Did you ever feel that way? Or you just didn't want to have to write the term paper. And yet I knew if I didn't write the term paper that would not go well with me in my English class. So here's what I did. I would, instead of writing a term paper, occasionally write a short story on the subject. And I did this for two reasons. One is because I knew that if you were an English teacher, reading term paper after term paper from students who were juniors in high school would get very fatiguing, right? You would just, by the time you're on term paper number 13, you're just going like that, right? So I thought if my teacher gets to a short story, even if it's not a great short story, it's gonna make her happy or him happy because they don't have to read another term paper, they get a break. And, and I thought they will also reward me for my creativity even if my thoughts aren't all that good. So I, I was calculated and, and it worked for me. I'm not recommending this to high school students. I'm not suggesting you be subversive like this, but it worked a couple of times, two times I'll tell you about. The first time was in Intro to Communication my freshman year. The assignment was write a paper about a modern day communicator and explain what makes that person an effective communicator. I didn't want to write, you know, I didn't want to go to the library and get information about the biography of some person and then it just, uh. so I wrote a short story about a family going to hear John Denver in concert. <laughs> 
and why John Denver was a great communicator. And I remember in the story, I had the family coming home and dad popped popcorn after the concert and put it in the big red popcorn bowl. And my teacher scratched that out and said, it's a yellow popcorn bowl. <laughs> and that's when I knew I'd gotten an A on the paper, right? <laughs> when they're in like that. Second time was Dante's Inferno. Did you ever read Dante's Inferno? Man, that's hard stuff, right? And so the assignment was, you had to pick three modern day people and you had to place them at some place in levels of hell and explain why they were in the particular level of hell they were in. That sounded way too hard for me, okay? So I wrote the whole thing in iambic pentameter like Dante's Inferno. I wrote it in, in poetry like that. And my professor wrote back, I'll never forget, he said, great idea, lousy poetry, and gave me an, an A minus, I think. I don't remember what. So this morning, I'm going to give you a short story. It's an allegory. I've titled this story, My Life as a Slave by Ewell Adamson. The reason I picked the name Ewell is it's as close as I could get to you all, which is what I'm aiming for here. The, his story is our story. So it's Ewell Adamson, clever, right? Don't you think? Okay. Ewell Addison, uh, Adamson, here's his story. Ewell had been a slave his entire life. From his perspective, slavery was just normal. He didn't think much about it. It was just all he'd ever known. In fact, slavery was all anyone in the Adamson family had ever known. As far back as the family could trace their history, every Adamson had been a slave. Ewell had grown up hearing people tell the story of his distant relative, the patriarch of the Adamson family, Adam Adamson, who had also been a slave. Adam, according to the family story, had once worked for a benevolent slave owner, a man named Gary Hova, who went just by his first initial, G. Hova. <laughs> according to the family story, Mr. Hova had treated Adam not like a slave, but had treated him like part of the family, treated him like a son, told Adam that as long as he was living with him, working in the garden, he was part of the family. Everything that the Hovas had, he could, Adam could share in all of that. He was part of the Hova family. Adam's job was to take care of the garden out on the property. He had to tend it, and he loved the work. He loved the outdoors. In fact, he was the first person to ever say, if a man loves what he does, he never goes to work a day in his life. Ewell had heard for many years about the fateful day on the Hova farm when Adam and his wife had been out working in the garden and a stranger showed up. Adam saw the stranger having a conversation with his wife across the garden. He dropped his pruning shears and he wandered over to hear what the stranger was saying to his wife. And the stranger who told them his name was Lou Seffer, <laughs> told them he was the property manager for a nearby farm, and so he was asking Adam's wife about the work she was doing here in the garden, working for Mr. Hova. Lou said, I've heard tell that Mr. Hova has this rule on the farm that you guys aren't supposed to go anywhere near that big tree over there, that it's off limits. Is that true? Adam's wife said, yes, sir, Mr. Seffer, Mr. Hover told us, if we even go so much as near that tree and touch it, we'll be struck dead. Lou looked both ways, and then with a big grin on his face, he said, that's a bunch of nonsense. That's not what's going to happen if you eat the fruit of that tree. You won't die. In fact, if you eat the fruit of that tree, you don't have to work for Mr. Hova on this farm anymore. You will be free to do whatever your little heart desires. All you have to do is taste that fruit and you get automatic freedom. Now Adam and his wife looked at, at Mr. Seffer and then they looked over at the fruit tree and they thought, that's pretty tempting. The fruit looks really good, but the idea of being our own bosses sounds really nice too. Even though we love our job here, it would be nice to do whatever we want to do, wouldn't it? Instead of having to do whatever Mr. Hova tells us to do. Everybody knows what happened after that. Ewell Adamson had heard this story many times. Adam's wife took the first bite, and then Adam took the next bite, 
And then later that same day, Mr. Hova found out what had gone on. He came out to the garden, and he started asking questions. They were hiding in the garden, and Adam and his wife bla started shifting blame to one another. He was, they were afraid that Mr. Hova was going to uh, was going to punish him. But after this conversation, Adam and his wife trying to shift the blame, Mr. Hova took a deep breath and he said, I am heartbroken about what the two of you have done. You're going to have to pack your bags and leave the farm. You broke my rule. You wanted freedom. You got it. You're your own boss now. Goodbye. So Adam and his wife gathered up their belongings and walked to the end of the driveway where the big iron gate was. It swung open. They crossed onto the highway and it swung shut behind them. And they started to realize that maybe this freedom that they had bargained for wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. In fact, a few days later, they realized in freedom they needed to find some jobs if they wanted to survive, if they wanted to eat. So they started looking around for new places to work. And what they realized was that beside the Hova farm, there was just one guy in town who ran everything else. And that was Mr. Seffer, the guy who'd shown up on the property. He owned all the other farms. So they went to Mr. Seffer's employment office to see what jobs he had. He was delighted to see them, said he had a couple of immediate openings, said they're going to love working on his farm because there are no rules on his farm. You'd be your own boss. In fact, you want to take the day off? You want to take the week off? You do whatever you want on Mr. Seffer's farm. Welcome to his worker's paradise, he told them. So they signed a contract, signed on. It did crossed their minds that maybe Mr. Seffer was doing a little bit fast talking like he'd done back in the garden, but their stomachs were growling and they needed some way to pay the bills, and Mr. Seffer was the only person hiring at the moment. Couldn't go back to Mr. Hova's farm. So without really reading the fine print in the contracts, they signed it and they headed out into the fields. Now, Mr. Seffer's farm was nothing like Mr. Hova's garden. <laughs> Mr. Hova's garden was beautiful, well-kept, in this place, there were weeds all over the place and thorns and all kinds of debris. I mean, it was just a mess. The crops were not, not in nice, neat rows like they had been back in Mr. Hova's garden. The farm was actually chaos. Adam and his wife looked at each other, and Adam said, I think it's going to be harder working here than we thought. But Adam's wife said, yeah, but remember, we don't have to work if we don't want to. <laughs> Just remember what Mr. Seffer said. If we want to stay in the cottage and watch TV all day, we can do that. So they decided that's what they were going to do. They spent about a week just sitting around the cottage watching TV and just kicking back. But there were two problems with that. First problem was after about a week of watching TV, they realized TV wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Pretty much run out of things to watch. They got bored with that pretty quick. Second problem was they were hungry. And if they didn't work, they didn't eat didn't take long to realize that the pre-stocked pantry in their cottage was running low, so they had to go out and start to do some work on Mr. Seffer's farm. And that's how the Adamson family came to work for Mr. Seffer. And for the rest of the family history, they'd been working for Mr. Seffer for generations. It's all the family had known. Now, Yule Adamson, remember him? He was thinking about his life as a slave working for Mr. Seffer. Actually, Mr. Seffer didn't like to use the word slaves to talk about the people who work for him. He said, y'all aren't slave. Y'all are free to leave the farm anytime you want to. Then he grinned real big because he knew there was no place else for him to go. You're free to leave, but there's no place to go. They were really trapped on his farm. They might not technically be slaves, but there weren't really any options other than working for him. So there was one day, it was cold and it was overcast and the wind was blowing really strong on the farm and Yule was out trying to make some headway on the farm in the weedy, overgrown section. He was getting nowhere. And in the middle of the work, he looked up and he saw somebody coming, a man he'd never seen before, a man with a, a big smile and kind eyes who walked over to Yule and introduced himself. Hello, Yule, he said, nice to meet you. My name's Joshua. Joshua Hova. I'm Mr. Hova's son, his only, boy, his only son. Daddy sent me over here to come find you. He wants you back, working for us. Follow me. Yule was completely taken by surprise. He said, now hang on, say that again. Mr. Hova wants me to come back, work on his farm? 
Now keep in mind, the only thing Yule knew about Mr. Hova was what he'd heard in the family stories. The farm sounded like a wonderful place, but he had grown up hearing all kinds of different things about Mr. Hova. In fact, some people believed the story about his great-great-great-grandfather Adam said that was just a big story that the family had made up a long time ago, that there wasn't really a farm, there wasn't really a Mr. Hova, they just made the whole thing up. Other people said Mr. Hova is actually a very harsh taskmaster. You go work on his farm and he just is going to be harsh. If you get out of line, he's got strict rules. The place may not be the paradise you think it is. You give up your freedom if you go work for Mr. Hova, they said. He's a tyrant anyway. So all of this was swimming around in Yule's mind with Joshua standing here and saying, follow me. And Joshua, because <laughs> he always did, he knew what Yule was thinking. He said, I know you got a lot of questions, but you need to know this. My father and I have been working on a plan for centuries to get you and some of your family back working on our farm. We love you all. We want you back with us. You don't have to trust me and follow me. You ready? Let's go. Yule's head was spinning at this point. He had so many questions. He said, well, what about Mr. Seffer? I signed a contract here. Am I really just free to pick up and leave? Isn't he going to come after me? Joshua smiled. He said, you do have a lot of questions, don't you? Okay. First of all, you won't be coming back to the garden right away. In fact, the way this will work is you're going to stay here on Mr. Seffer's property, but you're going to be working for us. Instead of reporting to him, you're going to report to my father and me. We've worked out the details. There was a price that had to be paid in order for us to get you back in to secure your release. And at that point, Joshua looked off into the distance, and you could see kind of a little sadness in his eyes, and he said, the price is paid. You're free to follow me. You're free to report to my father and me. After you've worked here in the garden on Mr. Seffer's farm for a while, we'll bring you back to our garden. You'll work with us forever. As for Mr. Seffer, he said, you need to know he will not be happy about you reporting to us. He doesn't really have a choice in the matter, but you've been his slave here not because he has ownership over you, but because you've chosen to live here on his land by his rules. You've been his slave by your choice, not by his. He really has no legal claim over you. You've been free to quit working for him this whole time. It's just that up until now, you didn't have any place to go. Joshua said, Yule, if you follow me, you start reporting to me, you should know Mr. Seffer is going to do everything he can to try to get you to come back to his farm. Work for him, even if it's just temporary. He's going to come after you. He's going to th say things like, hey, you need to ditch that Joshua guy. Remember all the great times we had together back in my place when you were working for me? Remember the big pizza parties, the all-you-can-eat pizza parties and the beer bashes we had? Remember the free HBO and Showtime you had back in the cottage when you were living on my property? Remember the casino, the parties? Remember all the fun? That's still happening. Come on. Hove is not watching you. Besides, it's your life, not his, right? Joshua said, it's going to be tempting when you hear that. I get it. He'll, but he, the thing he won't remind you of is the emptiness you've felt in your soul while you've been working here. He won't mention the mornings after the parties when you woke up feeling alone and sad. He won't talk about uh, he won't mention that he doesn't really care about you at all. Listen, Sefer just hates my father and me. You're just a pawn in his war against us. But he isn't going to win that war. Yule was thinking all of this very careful, thinking it over very carefully. He finally looked up at Joshua and he said, I just want to make sure I have this straight. If I follow you, I'm not working for Mr. Sefer anymore. I'm working for you and your father, right? Right? Yule thought for a minute and he said, back all those years ago when Mr. Seffer told my great-great-great-great-grandfather Adam that if he left the garden to be, he'd be a free man, that really wasn't true, was it? Joshua smiled and said, Yule, I'm going to quote one of your own poets for you to answer that question. You might be the ambassador to, kingdom, or to, to England or France. You might like to gamble. You might like to dance. You might be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long string of pearls, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yeah, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be Mr. Seffer, or it may be my father and me, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Come on, Joshua said to you, follow me. In fact, remember what John Chrysostom said years ago. He said, slavery to my father and me is better than any freedom.'" 
And with that, Joshua started to walk away. He said, come on, you follow me. The end. Now, people often say if you have to explain a joke, you didn't tell it very well or it wasn't a very good joke in the first place. If I have to explain that story to you, it either wasn't a very good joke or, or a very good story or I didn't tell it very well. The question that begins Romans 6.15 is the question that this whole story is all about. It sounds like the same question back in, in verse 1. Ver, there are a couple of, of differences. Verse 1 says, if you continue in sin or if you persist in sin, to trigger grace abounding. Should you do that? This verse says sinning not to trigger grace, but sinning because you're under grace. That's one of the differences. In, in the first verse, it's talking about continuing in sin, ongoing patterns of sin. This is really about single acts of sin. Should we sin because we're under grace and not under the law? But in the end of all of this, Paul, and I'm using John Stott's language here, he says he has rewound the tape and is now replaying it with two shifts of emphasis. The first shift of emphasis is you, in, in the beginning he said you can't continue in sin because you're united to Jesus. Here he says you can't continue in sin because you're a slave to God when you're in his family. In the first case, you're united to Jesus and dead to sin. In the second case, you're united to Jesus and you're a slave to God. The other shift in emphasis between the first half of the chapter and the second half is that the first half of the chapter is about what God has done in uniting you to Jesus. The second half is about your response to what God has done in presenting yourself as a slave to Christ. So he's saying you can't continue in sin because of what God's done, that's the first half of the chapter, and because of what you've done presenting yourself as a slave to Christ. You may remember that Paul began the book of Romans by referring to himself as a slave. In Romans chapter 1, he said, I am a slave of Christ. I'm a doulos. And the word that is used here, the word doulos, is devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interest. That's what it means to be a slave. You're someone who's devoted to another person to the disregard of your own interest. So with that definition in mind, look at verse 16. Paul says, do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obediently devoted to them to the disregard of your own interest, an obedient slave, one who is obediently devoted to the other person to the disregard of your own interest, if that's who you are, you are a slave of the one you obey. You are either devoted to sin and disregarding your own interests which leads to death, or you're devoted to obedience, to the disregard of your own interest, which leads to righteousness. So Paul says what Bob Dylan said, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to wind up serving somebody. And you can tell, we can tell, you can tell who you're devoted to by who you're serving, who you're obedient to, whose voice do you obey? Do you obey Jesus' voice or do you obey your own appetites? Who's, what's the commercial that says obey your thirst? Sprite, is that who it is? Sprite says obey your thirst. Jesus says no, obey me. Don't let your appetites control you. If you do, you're a slave to your appetites. Don't let your impulses control you. If you do, you're a slave to your impulses. Let Jesus control you. Be a slave to him. So a good diagnostic question for all of us is whose voice do we obey most often? Who are you listening to? Are you listening to your own echo chamber? Or are you listening to the word of God? You know who Nipper the dog is, right? Mike knows who Nipper the dog is. The rest of you go, who's Nipper the dog? Back in the 1800s, there was a painting of Nipper the dog at the phonograph, right? Nipper the dog, this painting is called His Master's Voice. Nipper would run to the phonograph whenever he would hear it because he could hear his master's voice coming through the speaker and the sound of his master's voice drew him. That's where Nipper the dog, and, and why, why do we all know this painting? It was the logo for RCA for many years, his master's voice. We train dogs to respond to the voice of the master, don't we? You ever had a dog who was not trained to respond to the voice of the master? How'd that work out for you? We had one of those dogs. 
We did not go through the training process that you need to do with a young golden retriever puppy. He was so cute until he was out in the backyard tearing up Miriam's garden, until he was jumping and hopping on kids and knocking them down, right? He was not trained. We had not taught him what he should and shouldn't do. He was not listening to his master's voice. So we just shipped him off somewhere else because we weren't going to deal with that, right? You train your kids to respond to their parents' voice. If you don't, what do you wind up with? A brat. You wind up with a kid that nobody wants to be around. A kid who doesn't do himself any good. So we all are going to respond to some voice. Is it our own inner voice? That's what our dog was doing, just responding to its inner impulses. That's what kids do unless they're trained to respond to the voice of the master. Is your heart inclined toward obedience when you hear God speaking through his word? When, when the spirit is prompting you through the word of God to live a certain way, is your heart inclined to say, that's what I should do? Or do you go, I don't want to? Whose slave are you? If you resist God's voice, you're actually choosing to be a slave to someone or something else, ultimately a slave to your own passions, a slave to your own appetites. And you might say, well, that's okay. I want to be my own master. I want to do what makes sense to me. And when you say that, Mr. Lou Seffer says, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was hoping you would say. That plays right into my plan. We've got to train ourselves to become obedient to God's voice. The same way you got to train a dog, the same way you got to train a child, you have to train yourself to become obedient to God's word. How do you do that? How do you do it with a child, with a dog? You do it over and over again. It's repetition. It's practice. It's, it's work. There's a favorite verse of mine. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 6 and 7. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ being trained in the words of the faith and the good doctrine you have followed. Then he says, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. The word for train yourself there is a Greek word, gymnazo. It means to train with one's full effect, to complete, uh, complete physical, emotional force. It's to acquire proficiency through practice. Gymnasium, we get our word gymnasium from it. It means you've got to do the workouts. If you want to be spiritually fit, you have to go to the spiritual gym and do the spiritual workouts. That's how you train your body, train your members to respond to the voice of God. And you say, well, what are, where, where's the spiritual gym and what are the spiritual workouts? It's the word of God. It's the fellowship of God's people. It's coming to worship. It's engaging yourself in worship. It's engaging yourself in service. As you do these things, you're working your spiritual muscles and you're training your body to be responsive to the things of God. Jim Boyce says, there's no secret formula for holiness, no magic recipe. The only means is to realize what God has done for us and then discipline the parts of our bodies, our minds, our eyes, our ears, our tongues, our hands and our feet to act accordingly. What has God done for you? Meditate on that and then train your members, your body, to respond accordingly. If this is what God has done, here's how I ought to respond. He says the failures we have in trying to live a holy life are due almost entirely to our failure to realize these truths or our laziness or sin in failing to apply them to our conduct. Why are you not growing in godliness? It's not because God does not have the power to make that work in you. It's because of your failure or your laziness to go to the gym, to do the workouts. God has promised there is grace in the midst of those workouts. It is your sanctification. It is synergistic. By that we mean you and God both are involved. Your justification is monergistic. God does that. But your sanctification, your growth in godliness is a cooperative effort. And you say, well, don't I get any credit for my part? Your part is showing up at the gym and doing the workout. You don't get any credit for that. God's the one who makes the muscles grow. 
So it's not like at the end of the day you can say, I should get some points because I showed up at the gym. No, you just did what an obedient slave is supposed to do. And God in the midst of that is transforming you by his grace. The transformation comes because you show up and God does the work. Now note back in, in Romans 6, in verse 17, Paul says, you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the stand, obedient to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, having been set free from sin, having become slaves of righteousness. You might have expected Paul to say, you were once slaves of sin, now you're slaves of Christ. But look what he says, you're, you're slaves, you're obedient to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. A couple things, that's an interesting phrase. A couple things. First of all, it indicates that there was some, some central apostolic teaching that was shared with the churches, that was a part of what was taken around in the ancient world, so that Paul knows that the Christians in Rome have heard the central teachings of the faith because maybe they didn't have a handbook but they kind of knew what the core was and everybody was sharing that with everybody else. The, the basic doctrines of the faith, the basic understanding that all believers needed to sign on to was, was common in the oral tradition among the early church. When I became a Boy Scout back in the 1960s, I took an oath. Any of you who are Boy Scouts, you took this oath as well. I said on my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country, to help other people at all times, to obey the scout law, help other people at all times to keep myself physically strong, mentally alert, and morally straight. I had no idea what any of that meant, okay? I was just told to memorize it in order to be a Boy Scout, so I did. Had somebody catechized me and what it was that I was pledging, I was saying, here's what a Boy Scout is, and I promise I'll do this. And then there were the scout the scout law that I was pledging myself to, a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Again, I just memorized that list. I didn't stop to think about what does thrifty mean? What does trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind? I wasn't thinking about those things. They were just words. But if somebody had come along and catechized me and said, this is, this is what you're pledging yourself to, I would have understood, oh, this is what I'm getting myself into. I'm becoming a slave to Jesus, and I'm pledging to do this. Well, guess what? That's what the Christian faith is. You're becoming obedient to the things that Jesus has said for you to do. You're, you're choosing to become a slave in response to what God has done for you. Kent Hughes says, what Paul is saying here for the Romans, slavery to Christ is not just a vague commitment to follow him. It's a commitment to live by specific standards of behavior that are derived from the teaching of Christ. It's not just, a, oh, I want to be a follower of Jesus. It's like, oh, there are some significant things I'm signing on for here. This is not just a vague, warm, Jesus sounds like a nice guy, I'm going to follow him. It's like, no, this is what Jesus commands I'm going to be his slave. John Stott says, conversion is an act of self-surrender. And self-surrender leads inevitably to slavery. And slavery demands a total, radical, exclusive obedience. Once we've offered ourselves to him as his slaves, we are permanently and unconditionally at his disposal. So if you have offered yourself to Christ, if you've said, I'm going to follow Jesus, here's what you've done. You have committed yourself to a certain standard of teaching that comes from the scripture. You've said, the Bible is now authoritative over my life, and I will do what it tells me to do. And you have committed yourself to total, radical, exclusive obedience. Total, radical, exclusive obedience. Permanently, unconditionally at his disposal. That's a mouthful, isn't it? That's a big, not just a mouthful, it's a lifeful. You are, you are committing yourself to big stuff. But Paul is making it clear here that being a follower of Jesus is not just trusting him, not just believing in him, not just acknowledging that what he taught is true and authoritative, but it is submitting yourself to it. You're not just a follower of of God as you're not just a follower or a believer or a child of God you are those things but you are something more than those things you are a slave of God that's what this passage teaches and by the way that's not emphasized enough in the modern church 
that's not emphasized enough in, in the teaching that's going on in our church. We hear a lot about being, being a follower, being a child of God. All of that's true, all of that's good, it should be celebrated. But in response to that goodness, we are slaves to Christ. And somebody who says, well, I'm, you know, it's for freedom that we just read it, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. I'm not a slave to anybody or anything. No, slavery to Jesus is the highest kind of freedom there is. It is a freedom not to be a slave to your own appetites and your own passions and your own wisdom, which is really foolishness. As this passage makes clear, if you want to remain a slave to your passions or to your appetites or to your foolishness, the pathway you have put yourself on is the pathway that leads to death. And by the way, this is not a pathway that just leads to death at the end of the road. Every step you take is a step of death. Okay? This, this is not just, this is not future tense death, it's present tense death. If you are a slave to sin, a slave to your own appetites, passions, and foolishness, every step you take is a death step. You're dying a little bit at a time, and the end is total death. You get to the question in verse 21 where Paul says, what kind of fruit do you get if you're a slave from sin? And the fruit you get is rotten fruit. It's poison fruit. It's death. I know some people, I've, I've known some people in my life who have been addicts, some who were addicts to alcohol, some who were addicts to uh, oxycotton, oxycodone. I've known people who were addicts to methamphetamines. Like anything that you're an addict to, you're enslaved to, whether it's drugs or sex or food or power or attention or the approval of others. That When I was a teenager, that was my slavery. I wanted attention and the approval of others. Whatever you're enslaved to, when you get a little of it, there's a rush. The first hit is really nice. But the end of it is death. In fact, when the rush wears off, the place you find yourself is one step more dead than you were before you had the experience. That's true whether you took a hit of methamphetamine. It's true whether you took a hit of pornography. It's true whether you take a hit of, of gossip. It's true whether you take a hit of fear of man. Whatever it is, there's a momentary kind of a euphoria. Uh, uh, the, what, what is it? The endorphins go off, right? There's a momentary endorphin rush, but afterwards there's a crash and you wind up just a little more dead than you were before. In fact, when we get to the well-known concluding verse in this passage, the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, we ought to be aware that Paul is not talking exclusively here about final death. The wages of sin is death. Yeah, the, the word for wages in that verse is a word that you, is used to describe the daily rations that were given to soldiers in the Roman army. It's the daily payout. It was the, they called it the fish ration or the, the meat ration. It's the daily provision of food. The, the daily wages of sin is daily death. That's where you're, that's what you're on the path to and it won't just end in death, but you're killing yourself a little bit at a time. The daily payment for your sin is daily death, and the sin of this life is a kind of daily death. And the same way, the free gift of God for all who believe and commit themselves as slaves to righteousness, that free gift is eternal life, and that's not just future either. Every step you take toward righteousness, every step you take toward godliness is a step toward life. It's life that you experience now as well as the eternal life with God. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it in abundance. That's not just a future promise. That's a promise for today for those who are walking the path of righteousness and godliness. Jesus said this. He said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one whom you have sent. That's John 17, 3. Eternal life means knowing the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in ever-increasing measure. If you try to find life and joy and peace and hope in slavery to sin, 
you will find that you get a little hit of endorphin and then the buzz wears off and you're a little more dead. But if you pursue life and joy and peace by refocusing your heart on the truth of the gospel and then living your life as a slave to Jesus, committed to obedience, committed to the pursuit of godliness, now you're on a path that leads to daily life and the promise of eternal life with God. This is why C.H. Spurgeon called Romans 6.23 a Christian proverb, a golden sentence, a divine statement of truth worthy to be written across the sky. Not because of the first half of that verse, the wages of sin is death, but because of the second half, the free gift of God is eternal life. Sin pays a wage. You get what you've earned. You get what you deserve. You've earned death by the choices you've made. God does not pay a wage. God gives gifts. And the gift you get is something you don't deserve, something you haven't earned, something someone else has earned for you. John Stott says, if you're determined to get what you deserve, the only option for you is death. But grace is a gift of God. And Paul ends Romans 6.23 by making sure you understand where grace comes from. It is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the source of grace. There's no other path to life than to be united with Christ and to be submitted to him as a slave. There is something in the human heart that longs for real freedom. That's why Adam and his wife were tempted back in the garden. He told them, the serpent did, that real freedom would be found by being your own boss, deciding what you want to do, living life for yourself and doing whatever pleases you. And what they learned was that's not freedom, that's just slavery to self to your own appetites, to your own passions, to your own fallen nature. It's a different kind of slavery. They didn't become free when they ate the fruit. They went from slavery to God, serving the God who loved them and created them, to serving their own passions and appetites. They went from the path of life to the path of death. John Stott says there's no such thing as absolute freedom for anyone. No human being is free to do everything he or she wants to do. There's only one being in the universe who's totally free. You're not free. You're a slave to somebody. And again, I'll let Robert Zimmerman have the last word here this morning. That's Bob Dylan's real name. You may be a construction worker working on a home. You may be living in a mansion or might be living in a dome. You might own guns. You might even own tanks. You might be somebody's landlord. You might even own banks, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. We have an opportunity at this point in our service to repledge ourselves as slaves to Christ. We do that by demonstrating. We come and demonstrate our union with him. Here's how we demonstrate our union with him. We take the bread and the juice, which are symbolic of his body and his blood, and we join them to us. We join ourselves to it. We are in communion with him. By the, this is a meal for slaves only. This is for those who are recommitting themselves to total, radical, exclusive obedience to Jesus as their master, permanent and unconditionally at his disposal. If that's you, you're welcome at this table for this meal. If that doesn't describe you, if you sit here this morning and say, that, that is not who I am, that's not how I'm living, I would say this, whether you know Christ or not, some of you here this morning would say, I, I don't know the whole story. I need to know more. I, I don't understand the gospel. I'm not sure I believe the gospel. That's fine. We're glad you're here. Some of you are here this morning and say, yeah, I know Jesus, but I've been living as a slave to my own appetites and my own passions. I've been living as a slave to what I want to do, not to what Jesus wants me to do. Well, here's the question. Before you come and receive bread and juice, are you ready to recommit yourself to turn from that obedience to your appetites and turn back to Christ. Before you come to this table, you need to recognize you're saying to God, okay, I'll turn away from my appetites and my passions and I'll turn back to you. All of us find ourselves seduced all week long, don't we? By the little thoughts, by the little habits, by the things we say that we shouldn't have said or by the things we didn't do that we should have done. We're all weak 
This is where we find strength, is by saying, Jesus, I want to be your slave. We recommit ourselves to that. So here's what we're going to do. For those of you who are going to come forward this morning to receive the bread and the juice as followers of Christ, this is open communion for all who know and love Christ. We'll come down the outer aisle. We'll receive the elements. We'll go back through the center aisle to your seats. Hold on to them. We'll take them together. If you're not coming this morning, we're going to have two prayers up on the screen during communion that I'd like you to just read and think about and maybe even pray. One is a a prayer for those who are seeking God. Another is a prayer for those who want to commit their lives to God. So you you can be reading those prayers. Those will be kind of uh, rotating on the screen as we come and receive communion this morning. And uh, after you've had a few minutes to prepare your heart, I'll call you to the table and we'll take communion together. come as you're ready this morning.
this is the slave's meal. This is where life and where grace and where strength come from. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus at the Passover meal with his disciples took bread, he prayed a blessing over it and then he tore it and he passed it to his disciples. He said, this bread is my body, my life broken, destroyed for you. As often as you eat this, he said, remember me. Lord Jesus, we do remember you this morning. We remember that we are slaves to you, that our life is found in you, that we are dead to sin and alive to you, that we are slaves to righteousness and obedience and not slaves to our own passions and our own appetites. Strengthen us as we receive this bread and as we unite ourselves again with you, repledging ourselves as your slaves. Amen. Jesus, in the same way when the meal was completed, took the cup, the wine, and he prayed a prayer of blessing for it. He passed it. He said, this cup of wine is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the remission of sins. As often as you drink this, he said, remember me. And so again, Lord Jesus, we are aware that the guilt and the shame that comes from our sin, you have washed it away. You've taken it on yourself. We are free from the bondage to shame and guilt. We're free from death and free from sin because of your shed blood. And we receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. Let's stand together. And we will sing that last verse of uh, There is a Redeemer. When I stand in glory, I will see his face and then I'll dismiss us with a benediction. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. And there I'll serve my King forever in that holy place thank you oh my father for giving us your son and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done Usually I close and have as our benediction the benediction from Numbers this morning. We're going to close with our benediction from Psalm 67. I was reading this this week and it just struck me this is a great prayer, a great benediction. So you open your hearts and your hands and receive this word from God. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.